particularly in Race Rebels, which I'll be quoting a bit from Race Rebels, but Race Rebels and Black Noise, to me, are the foundational scholarship texts for hip hop culture. Uh, and, and I'm borrowing this concept of infrapolitics um, from Kelly. And what he does is he uses it to study working class populations. And he begins to think about the ways in which people who engaged in domestic service and various other working class uh, enclaves use non-traditional forms of resistance in those situations uh, in order to politicize uh, or to politically respond to their own condition. I'm reminded of a, um, of a Latin American short story called Edison, New Jersey, where there are these guys who are delivery guys and, and they're delivering, they're from Edison, but they're delivering in all these sort of uh, up, upscale, uh, uh, high-end uh, communities in New Jersey. And when they go in to make certain deliveries, they make an assessment of, of the people they're delivering to. And if they judge them as being too bougie or if they judge them as being uh, too high class or uh, uh, too sort of caught up in uh, uh, the sort of their sort of capitalist wealth, they do different things to resist their own positionality. One of the things they do is that sometimes they, they will take a crap in their toilet and not flush the toilet. Or sometimes they might steal something. Or sometimes uh, they might rearrange things in the house to throw them off. Now, these may seem like simple um, or uh, insignificant instances, but what I would suggest to you is, is that those are political acts. And what Professor Kelly tells us is, is that when you are put in a specific kind of working class situation, a repressed or oppressive working class situation, you have to find these different subversive ways of redressing your socio-political situation. So infrapolitics is about that. And you should keep in mind that e Kelly and I are aware of the fact that these infrapolitics have to operate beneath the surface of a more sophisticated, more engaged, and a more power-oriented set of politics. But they are nonetheless uh, uh, indispensable. Now, one thing that these two guys have in common is they are both Marxists. So they are both very much invested in the value of human labor, uh, the means of production, uh, and who controls those things in particular society, and how that impacts history. So although they are very, very different, an historian and a literary scholar, they do have that one thing in common. And for myself, I'm always interested in the ways in which Marxism applies uh, to hip hop culture. So let me try to uh, talk a little bit about how the political unconscious operates in hip hop culture for me. And again, it's this. Uh, it's exploiting or excavating the oppression that is buried in any particular work of art. And I think I want to start off first by talking about forms. A lot of times when we think about politics and hip-hop culture, we're interested in what the content is, which is to say, what are they saying? You know, are they saying political things? And that is, of course, very, very important, but we also have to acknowledge the forms themselves, the actual forms as being engaged in a, in a certain form of politics. And again, what I would argue is this is how and where politics tends to get repressed. We don't think about the actual forms as functioning politically. Uh, first on my list here, I won't get a chance to go through all these, but first on my list is graffiti art. And that's really, really important because graffiti often gets cast as, um, uh, as simple vandalism. Uh, or the other end of that spectrum, it will get cast as uh, uh, commodifiable high-end art. But in between that, there is a range of graffiti that's built upon reclaiming the public spaces in inner cities. Um, it's, a, it, it's, it's a way of marking territory in urban communities that have been abandoned through various uh, crappy forms of city planning, so on and so forth. So we need to understand that graffiti art, not from the aesthetic standpoint, but from the form itself. Students and young people seeking a creative outlet that's not provided for them in the school systems, right? Or uh, see, seeking a creative outlet that's not provided for them uh, through the community, and they are reclaiming that through through the art. DJing very very simple. You know, D, you know, turning the turntable into an instrument is very very important political transformation for hip hop culture. You know, the, the, when you, you talk about Cool Herc or some of these early DJs, you know, they didn't have the benefit of, of, of public schools that invested in them in terms of arts and, and recreation. So they couldn't learn through their public school system how to play certain instruments, and that's part of the, the impulse to transform the turntable into an instrument. Again, I don't care, not why well, I care, but I'm not concerned in this particular point about what's being played on the record player. I'm concerned about the actual form of DJing functioning as a form of, of, of politics. Again, we could go down the line here, and uh, uh, the last two things there are, uh, are bootlegging and mixtapes, the way that things get circulated beneath the sort of surface of mainstream economies. All of these things for me are various forms of the political unconscious within hip hop. Things that tend to be repressed, things that we tend not to think of consciously as being political that I think we have to in order to understand the complexity of politics within hip hop culture. Uh, the next piece here is to think about how some of our politics are repressed. Uh, 